So thank you very much for have for being with us. Partha uh, is an honor for us to have you here. We are really interested on your work. It's a pleasure to be here. Or virtually, admittedly, but it's a pleasure <laughs> to see you. Yeah. We are we want to start with your review. Your your review calls for changes in how we think act um measure economic success to protect and enhance our prosperity and the natural world health. Um, what are the main calls that you found in your, in your work? Well, the way economic reasoning has developed over the past 50 years and more, and it shapes the way governments chart economic futures, consider essentially two classes of capital goods assets. One is what we call, we might call produced capital. It's like roads and buildings, ships, ports, machines, sometimes called manufactured capital. And another class is human capital, our education, people, education, health, which makes us productive. And these two types of capital assets are the source in conventional thinking of the output of goods and services which we enjoy, like food, housing, and so forth. But hidden behind it is, of course, the biosphere, Mother Nature, which is supplying us with all sorts of services, and I come to that in a minute, which are not accommodated in the economic calculations. And if there are only bits and pieces of it are. And so the review essentially asks us to take nature seriously as an asset, the biosphere as an asset. And when I mean nature and biosphere, that's of course global notions. At the local level, we are looking at say, a pond, a lake, a wetland, a mangrove forest, Uh, a coral reef, uh, rainforest, and so forth. Now, they, these assets are constantly giving rise to services on the basis of which we not only produce goods, but we exist. And these services could be, take for example, pollination is a service. Birds and bees pollinate, among other things. I want to go into a, a, a thing that you already said. You said hidden assets of nature. It's incredible that we uh, think that is something that is uh, hidden, but is constantly in front of us. Nature, lakes, rainforest, everything that you uh, uh, said is, is always in, in our present. Why do you think that uh, economics have ha, has had this blind spot, has a, such a huge blind spot? Well, firstly, it just because we see a forest doesn't mean that we understand what it's doing for us, what, it's, what the benefits are. Totally. Uh, except for those who are actually living there, of course. But I'm now looking at government offices in, in urban areas. And secondly, There are lots of capital assets of the of natural nature's capital assets, which are hidden under the soil. In the soils, huge amount of stuff is going on under us, under our feet. We don't see it. So this may be one part of the reason, but be that as it may, we need nature to be included in economic calculations. And that's what the review is about. I would like to ask you a personal question. How was your personal experience to work on it? I know you have uh, worked for a long time uh, related to these subjects, but um, probably it's just, a, it's just a, an idea, my, my idea. It did work probably change your life in a way. What was your, your, your surprising um, founds, your, your new thoughts, your new ideas, how this work changed your life? Well, working on a problem is an educational process. I've been thinking about this area for now, believe it or not, 50 years. It was part of my PhD thesis. 
And over the years, I have worked on many other things, but ecological economics, if you like, you want to put it that way, this kind of the issues that I raised in my review, I've been working on off and on for 50 years. I produced six books uh, on it. And well, specialists have enjoyed reading them, have learned from it. It has seems to have influenced a small branch of economics called ecological economics. But on the whole, it has not had any influence on government policies or even the teaching of economics in universities. Now, these two are not unrelated, by the way. Today's decision maker is yesterday's student. And today's student then becomes tomorrow's decision maker in a government. So teaching is extremely important, what happens in universities. And unfortunately, the subject of my review, the one you just now mentioned, is not there. Now, to answer your question directly as to how it has transformed my life, it hasn't transformed my life. I've sort of grown up with it. <laughs> this has been my subject in some sense for all these years. And I'm, of course, very grateful that the government asked me to write this review because I had the services of a team, the help of a team, of government team, to help me write it, prepare it. And so I could give it a kind of uh, structure, create the grammar in a tight analytically tight, acceptable form, so that it can be used by economists if they wish to do so. It you you have worked here for, for 15, uh, 15 years, as you said, uh, but probably you also were in that time, I, I, I can imagine 15 years ago, you were uh, an exotic person uh, in economics, maybe. Um, how this uh, review or the, no the knowledge about your review has changed the attitude of your partners you, the, uh, and new people uh, working with this point of view? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm asking this from a country that has lived for so long uh, only um, direct by uh, pure economic decisions separate of everything, <laughs> the welfare in general, not just nature. So that's why I'm asking this uh, now to you. Has changed the economic work uh, point of view after uh, your review? Yes, in some sense, yes, I think you're right. I've had a huge number of interviews like this, lectures, Q and A's, um, panel discussions uh, for the last one year nearly, because the review was, uh, launched, published in February, early February last year. So I've had about 11 months, let's say, okay? And I've met a large numbers of people, business schools, parliamentarians, business communities, you know, corporate heads, bankers, and so forth, because they wanted to uh, learn about it. And one reason I think there has been excitement in it is that I think some companies, private companies, feel that the source of their products where you know the primary goods that they import from tropical countries for example and convert let's say coffee uh, coffee beans and then convert it into a final product for the supermarkets so the profitability is likely to become more and more uncertain risky if the ecology the ecological status of the importing country for the, the country from which you're importing are uh, become fraught that is to say if the the ecosystems suffer degrade, further degrade, degradation. So they have a financial interest in maintaining biodiversity in the tropics. You remember, the tropics are also is, is the seat of the biggest biodiversity on Earth. On, and in addition, the tropics are also where the poorest countries happen to, to, to be located. So there is a connection a between mixture. poverty. Big one. It's a terrible mixture, what you are describing, the, the tropics That's are right. super right. poor and also uh, super affected. So, yes, um, I would like to go to um, some ideas that you, that you wrote in your review. One of those is um, you suggest uh, to change three broad interconnected transition requiring for humanity. And I would like uh, if, if you can explain it, because it's, 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 really, it's really easy to imagine a country that can follow this. It's, it's, I mean, the first one is ensure that our demands on nature do not exceed its supply. It's so 
obvious, but but we don't do that. I mean, so can you explain these these three um, uh, interconnected transition that you suggest? Okay, well, I'll start with one, which is that a lot of much of nature's goods and services come free. We don't pay for it, and of course, that's why the demand is very high, exceeds nature's ability to supply, make those demands on a sustainable basis. Of course, it's meeting the demands, but it's doing it by becoming more and more degraded. We're like mining nature out. So that's the first thing. And that's the one which needs to be uh, resolved. So take one very simple example. The uh, Amazonia is dying because it's been cut into bits and pieces. Okay. Now, there is a logic of these countries which house the Amazon forest to say, but look, we are supplying all this biodiversity and all the goods that the whole world is enjoying, climate regulation, for example. But why should we be required to pay the price of not cutting them down? So the one immediate answer would be that the international community should subsidize these countries which hold public goods, nature's public goods, global public goods, uh, because at the moment they are not being paid for. Where does this money come from? One possibility would be to have an international institution which will charge companies and people for the use of the open seas, because those are global public goods. The oceans are global public goods supplying us with huge number of services. And if you go fishing there, big trawlers, or if you go on cruises, or all the material which is shipped on the ship, nobody pays any rent for the use of that resource. So we could, in principle, through the United Nations, for example, collect a huge revenue, which could then be used in part for development purposes. It could be used in part to compensate countries which house these incredible global resources, which everybody enjoys, but nobody pays for. So that's one class of transformation that we really require. That's the second one. And the third one that you mentioned is how do we measure economic success? So at the end of the year, when the Chilean government asks itself or herself, are we better off? Is the average Chilean better off today than she was a year ago? Well, typically you look at a whole variety of indicators. First of all, it would be GDP per capita. Is GDP per capita grown? In which case the standard of living is higher and so forth, okay? But what we really should be doing, an asset holder would be saying is, am I wealthier today? And so is Chile wealthier on a per capita basis? But now wealth should include nature as well, not just the roads and uh, bridges and houses, and not just education and literacy, literacy and health, but also natural capital. So the third thing it, the, the review does is to urge governments to move to a system of national accounts, which measures stocks of goods and services, uh, goods, not flows like GDP. GDP is a flow. It says so many dollars per year, whereas a stock is a certain amount of number of dollars, if you like, of the commodity period. So wealth is the index that we ought to be moving to. And some countries are doing that, by the way. Now, England is, China is up in part, Costa Rica is, Norway is. Uh, so it's, there is hope there. The reason the third is important is that GDP is gross domestic product. It does not look to take into account the depreciation of assets. So you could have a whole uh, coral reef destroyed, but the, GDP, but the national accounts won't recognize it, won't notice it. Do you think mm -hmm. that countries Sorry. are yeah. like ours? We are a poor country if we if we look at other kind of countries like, I don't know, the... the, the the biggest, no, uh, United States or in including the, the United Kingdom. Um, do you think that we can do that effort? Uh, it's, it's, it's possible for us to think about, about our wealth and, and change our, our ways to measure economic success? It's okay for well, us at to? The end of the day, it's, yeah, it's, it's, at the end of the day, it's the Chilean citizen whose life is involved in the, in the Chilean government's uh, consideration. And you have plenty of good economists in your country. You have plenty of good ecologists in your country. There's nothing preventing your national statistical office from hiring economists and 
uh, statisticians and, and ecologists to have a uh, survey of the state of natural capital in Chile and try and price some of them to see what it's worth. First of all, of course, you want to look at the health of these ecosystems. Those are saying. But at the moment, in many most countries, they don't even know what assets they own because a lot of nature is sitting out there, but they won't be able to tell you. For example, when I first started working on this, uh, these areas, I found that most countries didn't have any inventory on fisheries. They couldn't tell you. That is, you know, it's just extraordinary. They could tell you how many factories there are, how many roads there are, what, how many kilometers of roads, but they couldn't tell you stocks of fish in the coastal areas or in the river, uh, in the rivers or in the uh, lakes. So it's stocks that we need to handle. Just as a firm wants to know, always wants to know what is in their factories, how many, what the furniture is, what the payroll is, you know, and so forth. Similarly, a country needs to have a accounting of the assets over which it has control. I'm sorry, I have, to, I have to finish soon. So I will ask you uh, one thing that is super important about your review. You propose to transform our institution and system, in particular, our finance and education system. What kind of transformations do we need in those specific um, uh, institutions to make this happen faster? Well, one of the first one is, of course, in terms of the companies and so forth, that people should be made to pay for what they use. If nature is coming free, there should be a tax on the use of nature so that it becomes more expensive. And that way, the direction in which projects are chosen will be more respectful for nature, taking into account the fact that nature is finite. So that's one a huge class of things. Payment for ecosystem services is an institution that is now becoming more and more common. So that's one. The education side, I'll end up with the education side because you might wonder why education, what's so big deal about that? And I began, remember, you yourself pointed out that much of nature is silent and invisible. And if something is silent and invisible, then no institution can handle it because nobody will be able to see the consequences of our actions on those silent and invisible processes, what's happening under the oceans, what's happening un under the road, in, in the soil and so forth. So the only way to protect them would be if we as citizens have some affection for it, saying, look, I don't want to do this because I'm hurting something I care about. And what I care about are maybe the microorganisms and the mysterious processes which are shaping the forest that I can see because I can see the trees. I can't see the processes uh, and the insects and so forth, which are enabling the, seed, the trees to survive. So if I learn something about the processes, the ecological processes, I'm likely to have some affection for them. And if I do, then there'll be an internal mechanism for us to exercise restraint. Currently in our society, the restraint that we exercise is is caused by the prices we pay. If something becomes very expensive, we move away from it. We can't export it. So that's how we exercise restraint. But if the, if, but I'm suggesting that even a full-blown pricing system won't work because many, many of these processes are hidden from view and they are silent. So we need to develop some affection. And hence, the review ends by urging governments and countries, societies, to introduce nature studies to young children from the earliest stages of their life, and particularly in a world in which is becoming more and more uh, urban, where your connection to nature is essentially zero. Uh, for that, we do need that. And that's the reason for it. So it's not just a tree-hugging point. It's a serious economic argument that you can't, what you can't see, what you can't hear, is unlikely to be protected by any institutional arrangement. It has sure. to come internally the, from the users. Sure, we need, we need to uh, make that that information real <laughs> to, to understand it better and to know it better. But new generations uh, give us some hope, no? <laughs> I may, maybe, at, at least for my generation, I see the newest and, and I think they are uh, 
they have more, more clear the needs, no? Well, I have a curiosity I so. about your conversations that you men mentioned uh, with companies. Uh, does companies have an open mind to hear your, your review? Oh, yes. The ones I've spoken to, oh, yes. They were the ones who asked to speak to me. I didn't go to them. I'm very impressed, actually. These company, you know, CEOs of major companies, they are, at least in, in my presence, they took it very seriously. They wanted to learn and they invited me to, to Do you think it's changing so, the point of view of the capital about the ecology and biodiversity? Well, I think yes. And the reason is that it's impossible to say no to it because the logic is absolutely staring at you in the face. I mean, we can't say that a tree is not a capital good. I mean, it's, you can say it, but then you're stupid if you say it. It is a capital good. It's doing all sorts of things for us. That not only just storing, but your carbon. But it's providing shade. It's providing uh, a, the play house for all sorts of insects and so forth. So, uh, I mean, it, it's so obvious. It's so obvious. Once it's pointed out. We hope that the stupid, stupidness don't go so far. No, we, we live in a strange world right now. Thank you very much for this conversation. I took uh, much welcome. more than they gave me. <laughs> Sorry, future Congress, but it's a super honor to have you here. Thank you very much for giving us your time. Thank you very much indeed.